Welcome to tonight's Wu University webinar, Wavefront Guided Individualized Vision Correction for Keratoconus and Presbyopia with Dr. Yoon. You can switch. Oh, there we go. And I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Yoon, who's currently appointed as the Urban and Boris Chair Professor at the University of Houston College of Optometry. His lab's overarching research goal is to enhance our understanding of optical and neural mechanisms underlying vision and eye problems by conducting human-based translational research. To achieve this goal, his laboratory has been developing various state-of-the-art technology, including advanced ocular aberrometers, wavefront-guided vision correction methods, binocular ad adaptive optics visual simulator, and in vivo corneal anterior segment imaging modalities. These capabilities have been used for studying mechanistic interactions between the optics of the eye and the neural system, vision improvement for patients with corneal pathologies, diagnosis and treatment of corneal diseases, presbyopia correction, and myopia development and control. His laboratory is funded by the NIH, other nonprofit funding agencies, and the industry. He's a recipient of the Dolly Green Special Scholars Award, Research to Prevent Blindness, and David E. Bryant Trust Research Award. He's a panel member for the FDA's Center for Devices in Radiological Health and serves as a member of the editorial boards of various journals. And with that, Dr. Yoon, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I will be in the background for questions if they come up and we'll leave time at the end, but at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sounds great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stewart, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to uh, start with my financial disclosures. Um, I have a, a personal financial uh, interest with the uh, uh, company Ovitz. Uh, we received uh, research grants from uh, NIH and as well as the uh, few different uh, eye care industry, um, including Johnson & Johnson, Alcon, uh, Meta, and Topcon. So, uh, so this is the title of uh, my talk, uh, Wavefront Guided Individualized Division Correction for Keratoconus and uh, Presbyopia. So um, my lab has a lot of uh, different research interests. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to talk about a lot of them today, but uh, if you could go on and Google uh, UN Lab and UHCO, uh, you will be able to find some other project uh, going on in my lab. And also, if you have any questions about today's presentation or other project uh, that we have in the lab, uh, feel free to email me uh, with um, uh, email address down here. So this is our line of my talk. Um, so I'd like to start off um, introducing some of the fundamentals of a wavefront, followed by uh, wavefront technology, including wavefront sensing, wavefront guided lenses, uh, improving vision in keratoconus. And I'd like to finish my presentation by introducing some of the new project related to the individualized wavefront guided presbyopia correction. So first of all, uh, hopefully you still remember uh, that you learned that uh, light has a dual uh, nature or dual properties, uh, waves and particle. So we're gonna treat the light uh, uh, as an electromagnetic wave for uh, today's topic. There are a couple of interesting, um, uh, important uh, parameters when we describe the wave as a sine wave uh, as shown down here. Wavelengths uh, defined as the distance of one wave cycle uh, defined by the uh, one pattern that's being repeated over and over again. Uh, amplitude indicates the intensity of the light. And third important parameter is a phase, a light phase. Light phase is the uh, angular quantity uh, representing uh, the fraction of the cycle on every single point on the wave. For example, if you start from the zero, we call it a zero pi in radians. And as wave propagates through it, uh, you could have a different uh, number up to two pi. And after two pi, the same uh, phase value uh, will be uh, repeated over and over again. So phase concept becomes very important when we talk about the wavefront, which is the main topic uh, of today's talk. So wavefront uh, is, is an imaginary surface over which a light phase is a constant. So this is a very straightforward definition of the wavefront. For example, when you have a multiple uh, light source arrayed on the vertical uh, plane, 
and each laser emits the uh, light uh, with the same phase and propagates in the same uh, medium, in this case, air. When you connect the um, you know, points at which the phase values are same, in this case, zero, in this case, is a minimum value, in this case is a maximum value, if you connect those points, that's basically wavefront, uh, as we just defined. Uh, light phase is a constant. So in this case, it's a planar wavefront because of the light passing through the uh, same diameter. Um, the same thing uh, could be applied to uh, the wavefront uh, diverging from the single light source, radially diverging, but the concept is the same. So you connect the, uh, the points uh, with the same phase values, then you can create this kind of spherical diverging spherical wavefront for the eye, it's a converging uh, spherical wavefront because cornea and lens will focus the eye. So this is how we define the wavefront, uh, connecting the dots uh, with the same phase values. So when wavefront propagates uh, through uh, the uh, uniform material, um, then uh, wavefront doesn't really change because uh, the refractive index is uniform across the field. But uh, when it propagates and, and hits the new material that has a different refractive index than surrounding material, then wavefront could be uh, you know, propagate, propagating slowly or, or faster compared to the surrounding um, area. So in this case, a planar wavefront propagating through the air and hits the small piece of glass that has a larger refractive index than air, so what happens is you get distorted the wavefront like this, and the portion where the uh, glass was, the wafer actually propagates slower than uh, surrounding area. So when you have this kind of uh, wavefront, we call this the slowing uh, part of the wavefront called the phase retarded, uh, compared as opposed to uh, other places, phase advanced. So you can call uh, phase advanced and phase retarded when you describe the phase uh, distorted uh, wavefront. So this way, that was a very simplified case, but in, in normal optical system or eye, uh, wavefront uh, doesn't go that kind of abrupt changes. We have a more continuous variations in wavefront. So uh, by knowing this definition of the wavefront, we can define uh, wavefront aberrations, uh, which is, the deviations of the wavefront from the perfect uh, planar wavefront or uh, perfect spherical wavefront as shown here as a blue line. So this is a perfect uh, reference wavefront and this is a blue line is actual uh, distorted wavefront from your optical system of the eye. So the green highlighted area is, the, is what we call the wavefront aberrations, deviations from the wavefront. Uh, from the perfect plane or spherical wavefronts. This is how we define the wavefront aberrations. So uh, that was a one-dimensional uh, diagram of the wavefront, but uh, because uh, you know the our eyes is a two-dimensional or or three-dimensional, uh, we uh, sometimes represent the wavefront as a color map like this. It's very much similar uh, to you know how we describe the corneal topography. Um, so. Uh, usually color rainbow color uh, going from blue to red. So in this case is a myopic defocus wavefront. You can see this readily symmetric pattern and uh, peripheral areas are all red. Uh, usually when you see the red color, it's a phase advance or advanced wavefront. Blue color is phase delayed or retarded. So or a delayed or retarded wavefront. You can see the myopic wavefront, peripheral wavefront, um, phase uh, is uh, advancing compared to the central part. But when you look at the high order aberrations, the shape looks a lot more complicated. Uh, some part is phase advanced, the other part is phase delayed, and uh, below that it's phase advanced again. So this is a phase advanced and delay uh, is repeating depending on the uh, locations. So when you look at this complicated uh, uh, aberration pattern, you wonder what type of aberrations um, uh, are being part of this complicated shape. So this is why we need to have this very convenient uh, mathematical tools that allow us to uh, represent individual 
uh, types of aberrations. Um, we call this uh, Zernike aberrations in mathematical uh, symbol. We call, we write it Z, superscript M, and uh, subscript M. So M is angular frequency. When you go around the angular direction, how many ups and downs you have, that, that's the number for M. N is, is radial direction. From the center of the wavefront map toward the radial direction, how many ups and downs do you have? That's uh, the number N. This is how we describe it, double indices. Um, so first three maps uh, representing um, a sphere or defocus and two different astigmatism. So we call them as a second order or lower order aberration simply because we could correct these aberrations using conventional uh, spectacles and contact lenses. But we have a lot more uh, wavefront uh, aberrations um, below that low order aberrations called coma, trefoil, and spheric aberrations. And this pyramid keeps going on and on. So it's almost an infinite number of um, you know, aberration modes. So uh, I just show uh, the wavefront aberrations up to fifth order. So anything below that uh, second order aberration, we call them high order aberration um, because we need to have a very advanced uh, or specialty optics to manipulate these aberrations, such as away from guided optics. So, uh, so there's a individual types of aberration we just looked at and each each type of aberration has its own weighting factor, which is called uh, Zernike coefficient here. So when you have an arbitrary pattern of the wavefront, uh, we could actually describe this one as a sum of individual wavefront aberration of which are weighted by coefficients. So if you add all these things, uh, different aberrations together, you could actually make up uh, this kind of a, uh, arbitrary uh, wave from uh, shape. So if you know the aberration, you can actually decompose them, decompose it into the multiple uh, wave from mode. Or if you know the coefficients of individual mode, you could actually reconstruct your um, original wave from. So you can go back and forth between the wave from aberrations and Zernike coefficients. So these Zernike coefficients that tell uh, of individual wavefront aberration to the total uh, wavefront aberrations. It's a very intuitive and very important uh, numbers that have been used in many uh, publications and research projects. So by knowing this uh, aberration, we can also characterize uh, different ocular pathologies. Uh, for example, post-refractive surgery eyes, you most a common uh, high order aberration is the spherical aberrations. When you look at the keratoconic uh, eyes, the most common high order aberration would be borecrocoma. Uh, for uh, trichonia transplant uh, eyes, the trefoil will be most common uh, high order aberrations. You can see um, those patterns from uh, these three different maps. When you look at, even if it's not quite regular, when you look at this pattern, you go back to the mode, uh, Zerunike mode. So this is a similar pattern to that, right? So you can you can say, oh, it's a coma. Um, keratoconic aberrations um, is well represented by large magnitude of coma. So uh, so aberration uh, is also very important because uh, this information allows us to predict. Um, you know, retinal image equality through this types of uh, optics uh, of the eye. So here's an example of how this wavefront, um, you know, individual aberration affect the retinal image equality. So this letter is supposed to be a nice and uh, sharp uh, capitalized letter E, but once the letter goes through this uh, positive spheric aberration, 0.5 micrometer, you see a blurry pattern. And uh, if the same letter goes through the uh, defocus now, it's three times the higher uh, magnitude of aberrations, you will get this kind of uh, uh, the image equality. So we could actually simulate um, image equality by using uh, this measured wavefront aberrations. 
But one interesting thing that has become increasingly very, very popular in, in the field is wafer interactions. These aberrations um, could interact each other to optimize retinal image quality. Let's see what happens uh, if I add these two aberrations together and form this type of wavefront and see how much a, a better image quality you can get compared to when you have individual aberrations separately. So uh, the interesting thing is we're actually adding aberration uh, or increasing aberration, but you, you end up having better retinal image quality, suggesting that you know, lower and higher order aberration could interact each other to improve the retinal image quality. So now, uh, how can we measure all these you know, different types of aberrations? There are a couple of different types of uh, wavefront sensing technologies, but uh, for the interest of time, I'd like to focus on uh, shark Hartman type wavefront sensor, which has been the most popular uh, aberrometer in the field of uh, ophthalmology and optometry. So here's an example. Uh, here's a you know, diagram showing the how this wavefront sensing technique works. So first, you put the uh, you know, very low power of the laser beam uh, onto the retina, and then light gets reflected from the retina surface, passing through the eye. And if the eye is optically perfect, uh, in other words, no aberrations, you would expect to see perfectly plain wavefront. So this wavefront goes into the array of small lenslets and divide uh, that each lenslet create a small spot on the detector plane. So in two-dimensional space, you will uh, get this kind of a regularly spaced spot array pattern if the perfect eye is being measured. So now if you measure a uh, real eye, which is aberrated, now same principle, you send the laser beam into the eye, uh, wave from coming back, um, out of the eye, and now you have a distorted wavefront entering the same lens array. Because of the distorted wavefront, now uh, individual spots it, are no longer formed on the center of each lenslet. It creates a, this kind of irregularly spaced uh, spot array pattern. So now by comparing these two images side by side and analyze them, you could actually measure how much individual spot uh, so are displaced from your reference point, uh, which is from the perfect eye. So this, uh, the size of the magnitude, uh, size of this uh, displacement in X and Y direction uh, corresponds to the uh, average wave from slope entering the individual lens. Width. So basically that's how we measure uh, aberrations. Um, from the uh, individual displacement of the spots. So this is uh, how the shark Hartman wavefront sensor works. But when we develop uh, this type of wavefront sensor, so we have to consider a couple of important factors to, um, uh, to develop um, optimal uh, measurement performance of the wavefront sensor. Uh, measurement sens sensitivity is one of those uh, important factors. So what it is, is how small magnitude of aberration this wavefront sensor can measure. So that's basically wavefront, uh, uh, that's basically a measurement of sensitivity. And the other important factor is a dynamic wind. This is a very much an opposite concept. How large, what's the maximum uh, magnitude of aberration this sensor could reliably measure? So these are the two very important factors. Uh, quite often, they have a, a very interesting trade-off. So when, you, when we do that, um, you know, if you have a long enough for focal length so that the small uh, deviation of the wavefront slope could, could cause the uh, sufficiently large uh, enough uh, displacement of the spot so that you know, the uh, program could detect that displacement. So that tells us, oh, this wavefront sensor has enough uh, measurement sensitivity. But what if we put very large aberration into the same uh, wavefront sensor? Now, what happens is spot displacement is now too big. So the spot uh, from this area and moving into the adjacent uh, centroiding area. So this would cause a problem because you know, we can't find the, this spot in this area. 
or uh, even worse the case, and uh, Jason spot actually, uh, those two spots are cross over each other. So you could find the spot, but you, this spot actually coming from this lens and not this lens. So even if you can find the spot, if you don't have this uh, crossover information, you wouldn't be able to uh, detect the you know, spot locations correctly. So uh, you can kind of see that you know, by having the very long focal lengths, you have enough sensitivity, but you're gonna lose the dynamic range. So to uh, overcome this dynamic range issue, um, you know, one of the simplest thing you can do is to increase the uh, lensless size. Therefore, your centroiding area zone gets much larger compared to this smaller lens light. But problem here is that now the lensless size is too big. The wavefront uh, shape over this single lens light is averaged out. Now you don't really have reliable uh, displacement, displacement of individual spots. You're basically losing the high spatial frequency information that was included uh, in the original wavefront. The other option you can take is to make those focal lengths very short so that relative displacement of the spot is much smaller than when you have a longer focal length. Uh, in this case now, because you have a, such a short focal length, now you don't have a, a sufficient uh, measurement sensitivity. So you may have a trouble measuring a relatively small magnitude of aberrations. So in summary, um, you know, if you start with a too many uh, lens, too small lensless size, which causes, you know, creates many, many spots, now you would have a good uh, sampling resolution because your lensless size is small. But uh, on the other hand, you will have a low dynamic range because the centroiding area becomes uh, very small. Now to avoid or uh, overcome this problem, uh, you could increase the lensless size, but now it becomes a poor resolution, which you will be conflicting with the good resolution you had originally with the small lenslet, or you could uh, make the shorter focal length uh, lenslet. Now you're losing uh, measurement sensitivity. So it's a very um, kind of complicated or uh, kind of you know headache uh, when you optimize the um, you know the wavefront uh, sensor, but. Um, so I usually uh, go through this process uh, to you know, simplify the problem. So first I determine you know, how many number of uh, aberrations uh, do we need to uh, reliably represent the uh, types of aberration we like to measure. And this information automatically gives us minimum number of lenses or spots uh, required to uh, measure uh, whatever uh, minimum number of aberrations we determined in the beginning. And then we determine the shortest focal length of lenslet to have um, you know, enough uh, dynamic range as well as the uh, acceptable measurement sensitivity. So by going through this process, we could actually come up with the wavefront sensor that optimizes dynamic range and measurement sensitivity. So it's not usually a good idea to have you know, as many spots as possible because of the, all these trade-offs. So it's, a, it's actually a good idea to optimize some of these uh, parameters. So now, uh, because the first step is to determine how many you know, aberrations you know, do we need to be able to measure to uh, reliably represent the eye's aberrations, so we did a study um, you know, uh, about 15 years ago where uh, we actually fit the corneal topography with a different number of uh, aberrations. And we look at the, um, you know, the uh, errors uh, in terms of rigidity or root mean square. Um, and, and then uh, we varied the uh, different number of um, aberrations. So by having this uh, curve, we could actually say, well, if I wanna have error below 0.1 micrometer, then you draw the line and figure out how many questions do we need. In this case, we need the 55 aberration questions, but um, you know, maybe the 0.1 micrometer is a too uh, you know, uh, tight threshold. You could use actually 0.2 micrometer as more realistic threshold. Now, 
you only need a 35 uh, Zerunicki uh, coefficients uh, to describe you know, types of aberrations you want to measure. And um, the other factor we need to consider, you know, even if you can measure you know, many, many Zerunicki coefficients, the, the question is, you know, is it really worth trying to correct all those aberrations? Uh, answer is a yes, only if you could correct the decentration rotation of your correcting optics. Um, but if you, if there is a you know uncontrollable amount of decentration rotation, it may not be the you know the best uh, strategy to correct all these aberrations. So this diagram illustrates that. So you know, imagine that your eye has a spherical aberrations. Your uh, lens has opposite sign of aberration, but in this case, with the vertical decentrations. If there is no decentration, this residual aberration map should be a single color because it will be zero um, aberration, residual aberrations. But because of the decentration, that decentration actually induces astigmatism and defocus and a coma. Um, if the decentration is too large, then maybe residual aberration is actually larger than the original aberration you're trying to correct in terms of the impact of, of those aberrations on the image quality. The vertical coma, same story. In this case, a decentration and plus rotation, then you get, uh, you uh, induced, uh, you know, a lot of different types of aberrations. So uh, we just need to look at the, um, you know, the magnitude of decentration and how much that decentration would you know, impact on the rigid aberration and retinal image quality. So this is a, an example for normal eyes for you know, a six millimeter pupil. So why access is a visual benefit? You know, how much visual benefit you could expect uh, by correcting all these aberrations as a function of magnitude of lens decentration when there is a five degree rotational uh, error exists. So you can imagine you get the, you know, the maximum visual benefit here when you have a zero uh, decentration, but that uh, visual benefit gets uh, smaller and smaller. Eventually it hits the uh, almost no visual benefit here when you have a 600 micrometer decentration. Um, so because there's no benefit, um, you know, there's no point of uh, trying to correct those aberrations if you have this much decentration. But if you have an even larger decentration, now what happens is your, your visual benefit becomes less than one, uh, meaning you're making actually making um, visual quality worse than without uh, customized or away from guided visual correction. So it's important to consider you know, how much uncontrollable decentration rotation you would expect to have that will give you, know, you a, a better idea of how many, you know, aberrations you are trying to correct. So now what can we do with all these fancy aberration uh, informations, including both lower and high order aberrations? Um, so we could obviously try to correct those aberrations or at least minimizing those aberrations by using the uh, wavefront guided vision correction uh, method. So this um, uh, simulation indicates uh, how much visual benefit you will get if you could get perfect correction for normal eyes and keratoconic eyes. So this is the uh, type of improvement going from uh, middle point to that um, if you correct normal eyes aberration. Much larger visual benefit, uh, especially for large pupil, simply because the aberrations uh, are much larger uh, for larger uh, pupil size compared to the smaller. So uh, the principle of wavefront guided correction uh, is relatively straightforward. Uh, so this is a wavefront, for example, myopic eye, you have uh, uh, converging wavefront. Uh, remember, my, uh, myopic wavefront peripheral area is a phase advance compared to the central part of the wavefront. Hyperopia is exactly opposite, right? Uh, the peripheral area is actually phase delayed compared to the center of the wavefront. And more complicated shape of the wavefront uh, uh, called the high order aberrations. Now to correct this, this is a phase advance, this is a phase retarded. Then we have to make this part 
propagates faster uh, compared to the periphery. So periphery, you get more material than center. Then after uh, this wave from passing through this material, then you get the flat waveform. Same principle could be applied to the hyperopic uh, wavefront or even higher order ablations. So one thing you, you notice here um, is that aberration is actually uh, equals the same as surface profile times a uh, refractive index difference between the material of your lens and then and, and then surrounding area. So aberration and surface um, has a very direct uh, relationship uh, each other. So uh, our lab uh, has been, you know, developing various types of, uh, you know, wavefront guided uh, ophthalmic lenses. We started with the uh, spectacles because it's uh, easier to develop and, you know, it doesn't really touch any part of the eye and it's completely independent. So we developed that uh, spectacles and we were able to uh, reduce the aberrations um, down to 0.3 uh, from like a three micrometer. It's almost a 10 times smaller magnitude. But one, one of the biggest problems with the spectacles um, is that when people change, change the gauge, uh, then the um, alignment between the spectacles and your, your pupil uh, is, is going to be screwed up so that um, it will induce a lot of uh, rotation and as well as the decentrations. So when that happens, you, we wouldn't, you wouldn't um, expect to have this kind of quality of corrections. So it's the significant limitations of the spectacles. We move on to the um, uh, soft contact lens, uh, which sort of moves with the, uh, your uh, gauge changes, uh, which would improve or minimize the, um, the limitation that uh, spectacles have. And um, but we were able to, uh, with the soft contact lens, we were able to reduce, um, you know, aberration down to one micrometer. So if you look at this number compared to this number, it's a, you know significantly large uh, in magnitude. That's because of the the residual decentration rotation um, uh, from the soft contact lens. Because the soft contact lens, there's always um, you know some decentration rotation. Uh, especially when uh, people blink um, every uh, several seconds. So uh, we end up uh, using uh, this uh, uh, scroller, contact, scroller contact lens. Um, uh, main reason why we uh, went for this lens is because of the uh, stability of this lens on eye. Because the lens is uh, sitting on the sclera, and you know, uh, the lens has a much smaller uh, movement and decentration compared to the soft contact lens. So, uh, so we were able to reduce the aberrations quite substantially uh, down to 0.22 micrometer for six millimeter pupil. This is actually better um, in a number than what you normally see in uh, normal eyes optics for the same pupil size. Of course, this is a kind of best case scenario, but you know, we, have some uh, worse uh, numbers uh, from keratoconus, even with the scroll lenses. But uh, we demonstrated that uh, wavefront guided scroll lenses is, is, is an effective way to reduce the um, aberrations uh, induced by uh, keratoconic cornea. So this is a, a kind of video showing the how uh, much decentration uh, is induced. Um, uh, for soft contact lens on your left and, and scroll lens uh, on your right. So obviously the, uh, the contact lens movement is very obvious for soft co contact lens case, but for um, scroll uh, contact lens, uh, you don't really see that much um, you know, obvious um, movement even right after the um, uh, blink. So from this, but still one, um, you know, potential uh, issue is the scroll lens is not sitting on the center of the pupil all the time. So this is a, a data from a relatively large sample size indicating where the center of the lens 
with respect to the center of the pupil. So zero, zero here is the center of the pupil. So all these, uh, you know, the uh, dots on the, on the plot indicating the center of the lens. You can see a lot of data points um, uh, um, lie uh, on one uh, quadrant, which is a, a temporal uh, inferior area. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, points are here. And for uh, the right eye and, and left eye, you, you also see the uh, temporal uh, inferior area, the lens center will be um, around there. The, the other interesting thing you, you, you can find is uh, the, the magnitude of uh, decentration of the lens uh, is, is varying quite a bit uh, between the patients. So you cannot really use a single value uh, or average value of decentration and use it for everybody. So then you're going to have a lot of uh, decentration issue when you try to uh, apply the wave from guided optics. So there's some additional uh, limitations when you talk about the wave from guided correction. Um, obviously, you know, wave from guided uh, optics cannot correct uh, temporally changing uh, any aberrations induced by tear film or age. And uh, the other limitation is if your cornea has a significant scar or your lens has a cataract, then these um, uh, scars and cataracts would uh, diminish the visual benefit uh, you could get from wave from guided corrections. So there's some interesting uh, clinical data showing that um, you know even if with some amount of scar and cataract, you still uh, expect to see uh, some visual benefit by correcting aberrations. So now um, you know the wavefront uh, guided uh, correction technology has been uh, evolved very quickly in the laboratory situations and we use a very large system like this to test this wavefront guided lens but now finally we have uh, a commercially available uh, aberrometer that has a full capability of measuring high order aberration as well as designing wavefront guided uh, contact lenses and this uh, system has a capability of measuring aberrations as well as a decentration rotation of the lens on eye, combining these two informations and uh, the software can design um, waveform guided contact lenses. So what can we do more with this uh, waveform guided technology? Um, so we think uh, presbyopia correction is another very exciting uh, field uh, where this wavefront um, guided technology becomes very, very powerful. Um, so uh, as we all know, uh, the presbyopia is defined as the uh, near vision loss as uh, we get older. Um, so you uh, get less accommodation uh, to adjust your focus uh, to different object distance. The perfect solution um, to this problem is to come up with a you know, special method that restore our accommodative ability. Uh, so there are a bunch of uh, designs, uh, mechanical and optical designs that are trying to restore our accommodation. But so far, um, we really don't have the one method that really works inside the eye yet, uh, although there are a lot of effort being put, in, put into this uh, field until somebody uh, you know, came up with a perfect solution to restore um, the accommodation. Um, most of the popular options at the moment is to use uh, bifocals or multifocal contact lenses or uh, presbyopia correcting refractive surgery. And more recently, uh, there's a implantable uh, pinhole cornea inlays and more popularly, uh, people uh, have been implanting uh, very specialty intraocular lenses, for example, diffractive optics, bifocal, trifocal, uh, EDOF lens. But these um, uh, types of uh, bifocal or uh, diffractive bifocal or trifocal lenses, one of the uh, you know, uh, limitations or uh, concerns about this is uh, you have uh, multiple focal points, but those at those focal points, you also have out-of-focus rays uh, superimpose each other. 
So you don't really get a uh, very sharp image quality, as well as the problem is you have a very discrete uh, image quality when you use the bifocal diffractive lenses. You get reasonably good quality here and here far focus, but in between you you simply don't have uh, you know good enough image quality. So this has been a, a problem uh, in 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 this field. So we, uh, and there are a couple other uh, factors that uh, affect the uh, performance of all these uh, advanced or premium uh, presbyopia correcting lenses. One is uh, uncorrected uh, eyes aberrations. As we discussed uh, until now, the, all these aberrations could degrade a visual quality. Uh, if you don't correct them, um, and if you, and, and then uh, implant uh, some of these lenses, then the benefit of those fancy optics actually diminishes because of this uncorrected astigmatism. So we uh, did some bench testing studies uh, some time ago and for different lenses, and this is a through focus performance. Uh, as you can see, the y-axis image quality as a function of different uh, object distances. So when you have a relatively small uh, aberrations, you get very nice peak here, and then uh, quality diminishes very quickly. For bifocal and trifocal, you can see nice and bimodal patterns, so you could get good quality far and near and intermediate. But as you increase the magnitude of astigmatism in this case, um, then you lose that original, uh, the bimodal or tri focal mode uh, patterns. Basically, you really don't have that, uh, you know, multifocality if you don't correct those astigmatism. And same thing could be applied to um, uncorrected high order aberrations, as you can see here. So with the relatively large magnitude of high order aberration, you basically have no uh, benefit of intermediate visual quality by having this uh, advanced uh, optical designs. So it's a very important to correct um, uh, these rigid aberrations um, to maximize the benefit of uh, these optical designs. And the other uh, limitation is, is decentration as we discussed. So if you have a relatively large amount of decentration, then your uh, retinal image quality gets, uh, um, gets, um, gets lower and lower as you increase the magnitude of decentrations. So this is true for um, you know, relatively simple, uh, low ad and high ad bifocal designs, um, as well as the EDOF. So, uh, so there are three um, main limitations as we discussed. Uh, you know, discrete uh, retinal image quality uh, through focus and uncorrected, uh, you know, uh, eyes aberrations and also excessive uh, magnitude of decentrations. So we propose, uh, you know, three solutions to to overcome these limitations. First, uh, we have a refractive extended depth of focus design to produced uh, continuous uh, through focus uh, performance and also wavefront guided HOA correction to correct residual lower and high order aberrations. And we also customize the optical zone uh, location to take the uh, decentration into account. So by combining these uh, three uh, strategies, uh, so we uh, come up with uh, this EDO, a very special uh, design that has iterative uh, power profile. As you can see in the diagram on the left, it, the power profile goes between far and near um, uh, repeatedly so that the uh, light energy gets distributed to equally to different uh, object distances. So once we have this uh, power profile, we can easily convert that into the wavefront profile, um, as you can see on the right. So the beauty of this design method is uh, you can always uh, customize your power profile. The first case is a linear profile, but you can actually induce the uh, nonlinear power profile. So then now you could control the relative distribution of the light energy to different uh, object distance. In this case, 
is a far weighted and you could actually do reverse pattern then you could actually uh, put more weight on far and near distances so if you do this you know different uh, design concept uh, then you could actually have this sort of this type of um, image quality uh, from far uh, an intermediate to near, depending on how you design, you can equally uh, distribute energy or you can actually put more energy in the far to maximize the quality in the far or far and near. So we uh, tested these designs, uh, our design, and, and, and found that the um, EDOF design actually provides a very nice and smooth uh, through focus uh, visual acuity curve compared to the obviously monofocal lens or even uh, trifocal lens. Uh, so uh, we're very happy about the performance. And so now uh, we mentioned that, uh, you know, all these, you know, scroll lenses uh, is, is, isn't, isn't really sitting on the center of the pupil. So now we have to take the decentration of the lens into account. So we measure the aberrations using a custom developed away from sensor or aberrometer aberrations. And we put the uh, laser marks on the lens to be able to detect the center of the lens and as well as a rotational orientation of the lens. By combining these two informations, we can design a wavefront correction profile, put that wavefront onto the decentered optical zone, um, from the measure, the decentration rotation um, of, the, of the lens. And on top of this, uh, now we can actually add uh, this uh, extended depth of focus presbyopia correcting uh, profile. Uh, therefore, we have a minimal impact of aberrations of the eye and decentration and max that maximizes the performance of this extended depth of focus to design. So the, all these uh, design and uh, considering the factors going into the uh, lens in one single step so that you can actually get um, scroll lens, wave from guided scroll lens that corrects eyes aberration as well as the uh, extend the uh, depth of focus. So this is a, one of the older subject. Uh, this is, in fact, is my own eye. Uh, so I don't have a keratoconus, but I need a presbyopia correction. So I uh, was the first to guinea pig, and we went through the wavefront guided correction first. This is a performance of the wavefront guided correction. Um, so blue bars uh, with the conventional scroll lens and uh, orange bars are showing the uh, aberrations uh, with the wavefront guided lenses. You can see. Um, most of the major high order aberrations are well corrected with the wavefront guide lens. You can also see that performance from these numbers uh, going from 0.58 to 0.15. And uh, we also measure the visual acuity uh, through focus and compare these uh, acuity values with the, um, uh, without uh, the scroll lens. You can see a uh, very nice and um, a nice visual uh, acuity pattern uh, gradually changing over a wide range of the dioptric power up to 2 to 2.5 diopters. So uh, we're currently having a, a research study going on where uh, we uh, recruited keratoconus and, um, and correct their HOA and also added uh, this uh, IR EDOF design on top of it. Um, we don't have a many sample size at the moment, but so far, uh, everybody who has these lenses was extremely happy about the quality. So, uh, so we will present the result of this um, wavefront guided uh, presbyopia correction in keratoconic eyes um, in uh, Argo uh, this year presentation if you attend Argo. So, uh, so that, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, conclude uh, my presentations. Uh, so we discussed uh, wavefront technology, uh, wavefront guided vision correction um, improves retinal image quality and also the quality of life in eyes with um, uh, cornea pathologies uh, such as keratoconus. Um, 
However, we also discussed uh, some challenges, including uh, the positional uh, stability of the lens, also the rotational orientation. And uh, as well as we didn't really have a time to talk about neural adaptation, but uh, we uh, think it's uh, important to understand how the brain uh, process the uh, informations, uh, visual informations that's not quite uh, familiar uh, with the brain, uh, how that uh, affects the uh, you know visual perception. Um, so there will be more uh, research and development uh, uh, need to be done uh, to have a better understanding of these challenges. So technology has been uh, evolved in the research laboratories, uh, but it's no longer just a research tool, but also uh, uh, applied to the uh, clinical practice. So this already happens. I believe that more development and commercially available devices will, will coming up. And uh, finally, uh, we are very excited about this uh, personalized presbyopia correction based on wavefront guided technology, uh, which is another exciting uh, application of this technology. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of our lab members and collaborators um, who helped us uh, get this project going uh, very efficiently, wavefront guided uh, corrections as well as uh, presbyopia corrections.